ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. Today we are at Hotel Europejskie, one of the most expensive hotel in all of Poland. The secret to keeping such a prestigious status relies on preserving history and providing luxurious accommodation. Today we will learn more about one of the most exclusive jewels of Warsaw. Our guest today is Mr. Xaver Wąsowski, a direct descendant of Aleksander Przeziecki, who decided to build Warsaw's first luxury hotel of international standards in 1855. After returning to Poland from the US in the early 90s, Mr. Wąsowski has been documenting the long and interesting history of Hotel Europejski. As I know, the hotel was struck by the bombs during air raids while the Germans invaded Poland during World War II. But due to some creative thinking and a little bit of thinking outside the box, the hotel was saved. And I was wondering if you can tell me the story behind that. Yeah, outside the box, inside the bathtub, literally. <laughs> um, all the bathtubs were filled with water. The uh, hotel director, Bolesław Koszyński, instructed uh, for this to take place. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, before the water mains were bombed and uh, no running water uh, was in Warsaw. Mm -hmm. So um, when the fire bombs did indeed land on the roof of the hotel and it caught fire, mm -hmm. uh, the hotel employees using bucket brigades mm -hmm. took the water from the bathtubs and put out the fire. So this saved uh, the hotel in the initial attack on Warsaw in September of 1939. Mm -hmm. So it, like, it essentially created like a water reservoir in the, the bathtubs. And as I know, there are numerous bathtubs in the entire hotel created enough supply to put out the fire. I, at stuff. that point, there was 250 rooms, 200. each with their own bathtub. So yes, that, that was a sizable <laughs> reservoir of water. But later on during the occupation, when Germany took over Poland, the hotel also serves a specific function, right? Exactly. The uh, German army, the Wehrmacht, uh, decided that the hotel would be a, a hotel exclusively for their officers. The soldiers were not uh, housed here, only the officers. Um, so the high-ranking officials, um, the, they decided to keep the Polish staff on the ones that knew the building, the technical aspects. And we have some memoirs of some of the employees that stayed on, including the hotel director, who I mentioned uh, before. So through their uh, memoirs, we know uh, many of the details that uh, went on inside the hotel. So during World War II, at the time, the hotel serves almost as an oasis of a sort for not only the Germans, but also for the Poles. And I was wondering how that came to be. Well, for the Poles, in a more minor aspect, mm -hmm. they had their kenkarte, so their ability to work and, and to go into this area of Warsaw, mm -hmm. which was a German exclusive zone. Um, so they had their jobs, they, and they held on to that. For the Germans, it was a more of an opportunistic um, aspect of war in general. The hotel was a oasis in the fact that uh, they had a comfortable place to stay. Mm -hmm. They had uh, plentiful food, mm -hmm. um, which was uh, brought here by Poles who were instructed to do so. Mm -hmm. So the Poles also took advantage of this to siphon off part of that food. So there was a lot of opportunities for the Poles and the Germans. Mm -hmm. For the Poles, mm -hmm. it began with the fact that they could actually work. So they had their Kenkarte. This was an important document allowing them to travel to this part of Warsaw mm -hmm. because it was um, uh, cut off for uh, the rest. Uh, it was just a German exclusive zone. So opportunities for the Germans were such that uh, this was uh, the place where they could relax, obviously. Uh, once the Germans attacked uh, the Soviet Union in 1941, uh, Warsaw was the way station to the Eastern Front mm -hmm. in going towards the east or coming back from the front. They would uh, have their rest and relaxation in the hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point where a lot of them liked it so much here that they would do anything to stay longer, including sabotaging any efforts to send them back to the front. Right. Uh, in the memoirs I've read, uh, one uh, officer who, anytime he would get a notice to go back to the front to appear at the railroad station, he would just get drunk. <laughs> right. And he would uh, be in no condition to mm -hmm. be sent to the front. And he would do this several times mm -hmm. until finally, after several weeks of uh, extending his stay, he was finally sent, mm -hmm. um, never to be heard from again. Yeah, so um, stealing from the supplies that were delivered to the hotel, 
um, and also uh, opportunity to hide people. Right. This is a big hotel, lots of spaces, lots of hiding places. Mm -hmm. The Poles who were employed here uh, used it to their advantage and to the advantage of uh, people that were running away from the Germans, right. including um, Russian uh, escaped prisoners mm -hmm. and Jews. Right. Uh, there were uh, incidences of this happening throughout the hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently found out about a specific person who I met in New York who, as a young girl with her mother, was living here in the hotel mm -hmm. under assumed Christian names. They had been baptized. And unbeknownst to anyone in the hotel, including the hotel director, uh, they were living inside here. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being, she, the mother, being a, a perfect uh, German uh, translator. Mm -hmm. uh, the Volksdeutsch German who was in charge of the hotel didn't speak so well, so she was employed to do all the official translations. Mm -hmm. And here, hiding uh, under the noses of the Germans, they lived. Um, and uh, she lived to tell the tale, the daughter and the mother. Mm -hmm. So yes, the, there was opportunities all around. Um, for war, there was always people that find ways of getting more than uh, what is officially allowed. Hotel Europejski became somewhat of an oasis for German soldiers, the Polish staff, Jews and Russian POWs, albeit for very different reasons for each of them. The beautiful interior and abundance of food and hard-to-find luxury products made the war seem very distant in the hotel. However, in reality no place was unaffected by the war and Poles often had to bribe or extort Germans in order to survive or save the life of others. During the World War time, there was a lot of effort on the Poles' side of sheltering the, the Jews. And seeing that this is such a big building, there's plenty of nooks and crannies, I guess, that would provided sufficient shelter. And do you have any stories in that regards of uh, how the Poles were able to shelter some of the Jews under the nose of the German soldiers? Mm -hmm. So we have the memoirs of several uh, wartime employees, uh, Poles, that worked here uh, that um, wrote about the fact that uh, Jews and uh, runaway uh, Russian soldiers were hidden in various places, in the attic, in the basements. There were areas in the hotel that the Germans simply uh, had no need to go to. Right. Um, rumors of this caught uh, wind um, of the German commander that was uh, in charge of the building. Mm -hmm. And at one point he called in one of the uh, very trusted Polish employees and uh, he said, look, uh, you know, I, I'm hearing these stories that we have Jews being hidden here. What do you know about this? Mm -hmm. And the Polish gentleman, uh, Józef Szalonk, uh, writes that he said basically, you know, reminded the German commander that, is it really worth his while to make a big fuss about this, mm -hmm. seeing as how the Poles know about his indiscretions with women living uh, with him in his hotel room, mm -hmm. combined with the fact that his family, his wife and his children lived in Konstantin. So maybe this wouldn't be such a uh, uh, topic that needed to be judged up so much. Right. And also, Poles had their ways of eliminating uh, Germans mm -hmm. um, outside uh, on the street or in uh, other areas. The German knew he was sitting on a uh, nice nest for yeah. himself that maybe he shouldn't ruffle the feathers uh, to follow the analogy. So during the 1944s, the Warsaw Uprising, this part of the city was not really a heavy place in terms of combat, but the hotel still suffered some damages and I was wondering how that came about. Exactly. It's a misconception that the hotel was uh, damaged during the uprising. No. This did not take place. The, the closest fighting that took place was the uh, Holy Cross Church on one end of Krakowskie Przedmieście and the Stare Miasto on the other. Uh, this was a German exclusive zone. This was the uh, most fortified area in Warsaw by the Germans. So no actual fighting took place here. When the uprising ended and the Germans were evacuating or preparing to evacuate, looting the city, right. um, the contents of the hotel most likely at that point uh, as well were looted. Mm -hmm. I have found aerial photographs by the Luftwaffe in the National Archives in the US, mm -hmm. which show 
weekly or daily bombings that took place um, after the uprising. Mm -hmm. And I was able to establish approximate dates of the destruction of uh, the hotel. The hotel was burned in December of 1944. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was left as an empty shell. And the aerial photographs show this. And this corner facing the presidential palace was not destroyed until the second week of January. Mm meaning about a week before the uh, so-called liberation by the Russians uh, of Warsaw. Um, so that, that's when it was destroyed. Hotel Europejskie has 150 years and counting a very interesting history. And the fact that the history is preserved and the personal touch of the place is what gave it the standard for the best hotel in Poland and has set the standard ever since I'm your host, Benjamin Lee. I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History.